The foundation for a new way of understanding the beautiful intricacy of our planet and how we can best steward its enduring stability is science. When E.O. Wilson conceived of Half Earth, he imagined that we would bring together our scholarship from many walks of life, many areas of expertise and experience, and work together within the spirit of a moonshot. He imagined that by driving significant scientific innovation, we would provide leadership regarding the most effective path forward for protection of endangered species and endangered ecosystems. In this moment, as we are increasingly coming to understand how caring for all of life must be informed by science, that research is the topic of our next session, The Science of Half Earth. I'm very pleased to introduce Walter Yetz, Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and of Forestry and the Environment at Yale University, Scientific Chair of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, and Scientific Lead of the Half Earth Project Map. Putting species on the map. Species are not just beautiful and each with a fascinating story to be told as, as we've learned from some of Ed Wilson's writing. They're also the critical elements that underpin nature's benefits to people. Their populations are declining, which means we're often starting to lose some of these benefits, but nothing is as troubling, I would argue, as wholesale extinctions, because those are essentially irreversible. So how can we prevent losing species um, and ensure that we safeguard them for future generations? We need to put them on the map and that means we need to deliver the best possible science and evidence that at least we're not unknowingly losing some of these species, that we support effective conservation decision making. And in essence, it means we need to identify the places that are needed to safeguard species. That's a huge effort and we are really fortunate and excited to be able to bring together a whole large group of talented junior scientists to support this effort with models, with informatics, with taxonomic expertise. And uh, we are convening the, the global scientific community, for example, under the umbrella of the Geo Biodiversity Observation Network to think about the essential information that is needed to uh, address species distributions and support conservation decision making and that allows us to at increasingly fine spatial detail predict model um, some of those species here for example a hummingbird in South America at a kilometer resolution and it's that sort of detail that begins us that begins uh, to enable us a, a smart conservation decision making on the ground here an effort led by Charles Marsh for mammals worldwide again at a kilometer resolution here bringing out the, the diversity hotspots and cold spots in, in really fascinating detail here for primates in East Africa. And it's with this sort of information that we can then begin to, to support the decisions regionally, the decisions that need to be taken by others, uh, local stakeholders, that at all levels we want to support with this information to, for example, ensure that species such as the, the Ugandan red colobus are uh, conserved for future uh, generations. So as scientists, uh, we can't dictate what sort of information, what sort of decisions might actually happen and how it, this information needs to be brought into the picture and brought together with other pieces. Um, but uh, we can at least provide that piece and it's a really uh, important piece. Here we are at the global scale beginning to, to uh, link that information up ourselves with at least some other pieces such as the existing a reserve network, what we know about encroachment already happening in the region. And it's that sort of a combination and the use of spatial optimization procedures that, that bring in complementarities of which these places would combine best to provide um, conservation for as many species as possible uh, uh, going forward. And it's, it's these sorts of approaches that give us priority maps, half earth maps, if you will, of where are the places that are most urgently needed to be brought under some sort of conservation management, whether that be a protected area or other approaches, so that species can be safeguarded uh, going forward. So in yellow here, places that are particularly important. 
And we don't need quite yet uh, half of the planet for this, at least not for terrestrial vertebrates, but as we think about additional groups, we need to think about more and more of these places. And we critically need to bring that together with other information. We need to offer this up to indigenous uh, communities, to um, uh, decision makers at all levels to use this information as they think about spatial planning in the regions. We need to recognize, though, that these places are very unevenly distributed across the globe and that the tropics in particular, the biomes there, have a particularly large burden. The, the people there ultimately have a particularly large burden to think about how they can not just safeguard but also manage and restore some of the places there so that species aren't going extinct globally. So this requires a pulling together of the global community to make this happen. It also needs a consideration of additional dimensions such as carbon and water to ensure that we are not just optimizing biodiversity conservation but also carbon uh, storage and, and water uh, security going forward for everybody. We can extend that thinking to the marine realm here, uh, work on marine fishes that follows a similar kind of uh, approach and that allows us to identify the most important places for safeguarding fish uh, species going forward. And in this case, not just thinking about that species group, but also uh, addressing uh, the, the cost of things, or the opportunity cost, so the fishing uh, cost, the, the loss to, to, to fishing economies in the region. And there are ways to ultimately optimize both so that you really minimize uh, the burden that's placed on regional fishing economies. Now, this year is a particularly important and exciting year to think about these issues as we are in the midst of the post-2020 biodiversity framework discussions. What is that? It's uh, one of the conventions under the, that came out of the Rio Earth Summit 1992. Many of you will be familiar with the uh, um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the IPCC process that was associated with that, that brought about the Paris Agreement, a really bold agreement that nations worldwide committed to, to limiting temperature increases going forward. Now, we are in a similar sort of process leading up to the 21 Kunming Agreement next year that we all hope might be a similar sort of Paris moment of a bold target for uh, biodiversity. And it's under the Convention on Biological Diversity that these negotiations are, are taking place. And it's um, uh, with, in the context of these action targets that uh, countries are currently discussing that we can think about what might be next and how we can contribute science to these efforts. There is a, a relatively ambitious target being discussed right now of 30% conservation of land and sea, uh, with areas particularly important for biodiversity by 2030. There is also an emphasis on quality information, so importance of science in contributing to this and an importance of the equitable participation by all, so all genders, all races, all uh, types of, of administration, all regions, indigenous communities, everybody should be empowered to contribute to these decisions. And that's why the not just the rigorous development, but also the sharing and democratizing of this information is so important. That fits beautifully with what we're trying to support with the half earth science. And one particular concrete contribution that we're developing is uh, an index, an indicator that's already been used in some of the assessment processes and is listed for uh, that effort going forward under the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's a very simple metric. It's how well are countries respectively doing in conserving the species that they hold responsibility for. So how close to what would be an, a minimum a target of conservation areas supporting a particular species are they meeting? So an SPI, a Species Protection Index of 100, would mean that all of a country's species are sufficiently represented in either formal or informal reserves or, or conservation areas. How well are we doing for terrestrial vertebrates right now? We were able to quantify that and it's not 100%. We are at about 41% on average uh, that we are achieving. So there's a lot yet to be done to ensure that all species of terrestrial vertebrates are sufficiently safeguarded going forward. And some countries here have a particularly large burden and responsibility. Countries such as Madagascar, Australia, Philippines hold a lot of the very restricted, unique biodiversity of the world and have a lot to do. And it can't be just their responsibility. We need to pull together as a global community, which fits very much 
the convention of biological diversity uh, discussions. And by the way, the United States here also in the top 25 as global uh, of countries worldwide in terms of the amount of unique biodiversity that they hold responsibility for, and still quite a bit to go. An SPI of currently estimated 55, so much more to be done in supporting conservation action. And how does this happen? Well, it happens at the regional level, at the state level, as in the US, as well as in many other countries. So that's where the rubber hits the road. And in the case of California, for example, quite a, a substantial global responsibility that's held by just this state, uh, over 1,700 plant species occurring uh, in just that region. So California holds the global responsibility for these species. And we're really fortunate last year at Half Earth Day to support some of the key conversations around this responsibility and the actions and activities that might be happening in support of a Half Earth type uh, um, role in California. And uh, we had the secretary of the California Natural Resource Agency there. We had the former governor speak to us about those opportunities, those needs. And uh, it, 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 it was immensely uh, special when then just earlier this month, Governor Newsom of California went ahead and committed the state to 30% of land and coastal waters to be conserved by 2030. And it's the first state that's supporting the goals, this ambitious target by the Convention of Biological Diversity that's currently still under discussion. So an amazing uh, role model here, if you will, played by the state of California. So with that, we say thank you, Governor Newsom. I thank you for, for listening and I hope I was able to excite you about the opportunities and the need to bring science at the global as well as down to the regional and ultimately one kilometer and final spatial resolution into um, some of these conversations. And uh, uh, beautifully linking to that is a panel discussion that we're holding in about 15 minutes today on Half Earth Day, where we'll be bringing together some of the key decision makers uh, and, and players in California, uh, including the Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity, uh, as well as uh, at the global scale, uh, representatives from the World Conservation Monitoring Center, as well as uh, joining a conversation uh, around these ambitious targets in California and how science can contribute to ensure that evidence uh, and policy are being brought together across scale. So please join us for these conversations. And now I'm handing over to Craig Miltz of Visuality to talk more about the specific exciting ways in which we can um, convey this information to all sorts of uh, levels of society. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I think you'll agree when you start to look at the science and the outputs that are possible from the Half Earth project, we are at a unique moment in time because now we have the information and we will have more information as we go that will allow us to embed species information at high resolution right at the center of society. And we start with the big decisions that are being taken at the intergovernmental levels right now through the end helping governments understand how to set their targets through the Species Protection Index. But that's just the beginning. Once targets are set, the world needs to then protect half of the planet. And when I start to think about that, I look at that as a 20-year problem. In 20 years' time, I hope, half of the planet will be protected. And when I look at that, I also start to think about the last 20 years. And, if, and these are pictures of every summer over the last 20 years. So think about it, it's like a 20 summer problem, right? And when I look at that, I think to myself, okay, so as well as dealing with what's happening today, we need to prepare those young professionals or those people late in their academic careers uh, or their education we need to prepare them for when the moment comes where they have more influence, they are ready to join this movement and to protect half of the planet. Because whilst technology can be used for helping intergovernmental processes, 
It has to go way beyond that because half earth is a movement. And we can supply information and we can supply science to the technical, technically minded. But it also is being received by humans and humans are emotional creatures and humans will require information in a way which not only sorts out their logical mind but also sorts out their emotional one too. And I'll give you an example of this. Let's say I want to know something about Gorongosa National Park. So I want to know where Gorongosa National Park is. So what do I do? I go into Google, I type in Gorongosa National Park, I go to the map and I find out where it is. But what if I wanted to get a feel of Gorongosa National Park? What if I wanted to get just a sense and a feeling of what was there? Then you'd want to present information in very different ways. Actually, the underlying data, the underlying science and technology is very similar. What is different is how you apply like emotion to the design of that information. And for me, that's really important. And it's a principle we try and translate through the mapping work of, of Half Earth and all the technology that we're building around this. Because in these next 20 years, we are going to have to connect with people's hearts as well as their minds. So when you look at the Half Earth Project map online, and this is available online to go and explore, you'll get a sense of vibrancy. You'll get a sense of um, the ability to explore and play. You'll see that there is science and data that underpin all of these maps, but we try and present it in a way which kind of invokes a level of exploration. So you can go to Madagascar and you can see how well they're protecting their place. You can look at what the pressures are in that area. And you can start to understand and get an appreciation and a feel for those places. For me, that's really important. Now, if we take the example of target setting and countries trying to figure out how much of their land and sea that they need to protect, then emotion comes into that too. And what we've tried to do is through the power of this new science, allow people to explore every single country on the planet, look at the species protection ind indices of those places, and get a feel for those places while they're doing it. So you can go to Costa Rica, you understand that the species protection index is 52.9. And you can look at where in the country it's best to protect next, certainly for land vertebrate species. And you can look where they're protecting currently. You can start to delve into individual species. You can start to look at the composition of vertebrate species. And as we get more, map more and more species, you'll get more and more information, right? You can get you know, more nerdy if you want, and you can look at all the lists and you can go on further from there if you want to. And to try and make this as accessible as possible, if you don't have great internet speeds, then you can take this away as fact sheets and share it with people. Again, I see this as an incredibly important part of it. Now, this is cool. So you go to Costa Rica and you say, okay, so which other countries are a bit like mine? Of course, the first country you think about is Azerbaijan, right? So you go to Azerbaijan and you go, well, actually, this species protection index is similar to mine. And I'm going to see how they're doing. And I'm going to try and talk to them. And I'm going to see what species are there. And I'm going to get lost in, wouldn't it be great to get lost in, like, um, the exploration of the planet rather than Facebook feeds? That'd be good, right? And that's what we're trying to achieve, that sense of wonder. I just wanted to touch briefly on the, again this 20 year time horizon that we've got that there's some there's there's some forces at play here which are going to come into effect in the next probably five years one of those are uh hardware so soon we'll be able to put a set of glasses on we'll be able to immerse ourselves in nature and for me that's incredible like the big hardware organizations are already 
uh, putting out technology which can do this. And we're trying to set up, you'll see with the three-dimensional work that we do with the Half Earth uh, experience, that we're preparing ourselves for the moment when technology moves and when augmented reality, virtual reality becomes a thing which is used by more and more people. And even if it's not, certainly connectivity to each other into places are going to get higher. And this is really critical now because those forces at play, those forces of improving technology, improving accuracy, resolution and uh, of science is all going to be underpinned by something which we don't have to do anything about, which is the biophilia, right? As E. Olson would say. We want to connect people. Humans want to be connected with nature. And we're providing a digital experience which allows them to do it. So while they, while humans leave nature and move to cities, which is an urban areas, which is already happening, and nature recedes from them, which is already happening, we want to just invoke that biophilia in people by creating experiences which immerse them in nature. And if we can do that over the next 20 years, hopefully I'll be close to retirement by then, we will be able to protect half of the planet. Thank you.